the show that reveals how extraordinary items in our world are designed, constructed and produced. See the engineering, the technology and big ideas that make the world go round. Find out how it works. Coming up, printing a bestseller, how the pages get stuck into a good book, metal magic, the making of a samurai sword, and how corn on the cob is turned into niblets in a tin. But first, sports companies are constantly competing with each other to design footballs which are rounder and faster than ever before. And although David Beckham might be able to tell you how to bang in a great free kick, if you want to know how a great ball is made, then you've got to go to a manufacturer. The outside of the ball is made from a sheet of foam. It's been coated in polyurethane, which will help to stop it from getting scuffed. It'll be attached to an inner layer next. So they prepare the foam by coating it in glue. They use a latex glue, which is elastic. This will help the layers to stay together, despite the strains of being kicked at 80 miles per hour. The sheets are then left on a rack until the glue becomes tacky. Next, they're going to join the two layers together. The foam's placed on top of the inner layer, which is made from a special fibre that will help the ball keep its shape. A worker uses a roller to press them together. Then the layers pass through a machine which applies pressure to the sheets, and they form a permanent bond. The foam gives the ball an explosive energy to make it fly off the boot. Image isn't just important for footballers, it's important for footballs too. The ball's design is put on using a screen printer. This machine punches out the shaped panels that will make the football. Each ball is made from 32 panels, 20 hexagons and 12 pentagons. A worker bundles them together into stacks to be sent off for stitching. It's all looking a bit flat at the moment, but the contents of this box will soon become 20 footballs. They are sewn together by hand. The stitcher will use 15 meters of thread per ball, and it will take him three and a half hours to finish each one. He leaves a few panels unstitched so the ball can be turned the right way out. Then the inner tube gets put in and the ball can be completely sewn up. It's inflated and looks ready for the pitch, but there are a few more steps to go. This machine puts the ball under high pressure and heats it up to 70 degrees. It makes the ball even and perfectly round. Then there are a couple of checks that have to be done to make sure that it meets FIFA regulations. It needs to weigh between 420 and 445 grams, and the circumference has to be 69 centimeters. FIFA only allow five millimeters leeway. The factory only produces 750 balls a day. Hours are spent making each one to exacting standards. If only the England team spent as long practicing penalties, then maybe they'd hit the top corner a bit more often.
This is the handle of one of the most deadly weapons in the world. The blade is made from some 30,000 layers of steel. This is the legendary samurai sword. In this smithy, they still make the swords in the same tradition that has been used for centuries. An apprentice pieces together fragments of a rare metal called jewel steel, known in Japan as tamahagane. He wraps about two kilos of the steel in paper to hold it together. Coats the parcel in ash, and then spoons over some muddy water, which will help draw out impurities when the steel goes into the furnace. The furnace is red hot, almost a thousand degrees Celsius. Despite the intense heat, the steel still needs to be heated for 15 minutes before it's even slightly softened. Then they batter it with a sledgehammer to fuse the pieces together. They coat it with ash again and reheat it in the furnace so that it can take another battering. They repeat this process for half an hour until the fragments become one lump of pure steel. They need to fold the steel in half, and to do this use a hammer and chisel combined with brute force. The steel is given another splash of muddy water and heads back to the furnace before being folded again. As they fold the steel, the layers increase rapidly. After three folds, there'll be eight layers, after five, 32, and after up to 15 folds, incredibly, there could be over 30,000. The last folds have to be flattened with a mechanical hammer. The apprentice's work is complete and it's time for the master to craft the blade. With so many layers of pure steel, it's incredibly strong, and it takes him days to knock it into shape. After the master has finished shaping the steel, it's painted with clay. This isn't just to give it an ornate pattern. When it goes back in the furnace, the clay will cause different temperatures to build up on parts of the blade. This will make some parts softer and more flexible. It has to be heated to exactly the right temperature and for the right amount of time. Too short a time and the exposed steel wouldn't get hot enough but if it's heated for too long, then the painted area would reach the same temperature as the rest of the blade. That's why the room's so dark. They can tell how hot the sword is by the color it glows. The master checks the blade again, and then he begins to sharpen it. He scrapes it on soft stones which are lubricated with water, creating an incredibly fine point which could cut through armor. Thankfully, it's more likely to end up as a collector's piece. Finally, it's given an ornate handle. After three weeks of sweat and toil, there is a single sword, both beautiful and deadly. Still to come, word perfect the mass production of a book.
and the long and winding road which takes corn from the field to the can. Corn is one of the most popular foodstuffs in the world. We eat cornflakes for breakfast, have corn on the cob with our dinner, and ruin films by noisily chomping our way through boxes of popcorn at the cinema. But this is the story of how sweet corn gets from the field to the can. Combine harvesters plough through these fields all day long. They cut the stems just above the ground and then the cobs are removed and shot into a hopper. Once the hopper's full, the mass of corn gets transferred to a truck that goes straight off to the factory so the corn can be processed. The trucks dump mountains of corn onto the courtyard and then ploughs push the cobs onto the conveyor belts. At the end of the belt, the cobs plunge down into a machine. They're then pulled through by a series of wheels which grip the leaves and tear them away. As the cobs cruise past, workers pick out any that are rotten, and for them, the game is up. They'll be turned into pet food. This machine uses a light sensor to check that the cobs are all facing in the same direction. If any are back to front, a lever gives them a nudge to spin them around. And now it's time for them to go from corn on the cob to corn off the cob. They're pushed through spinning knives that adjust to fit the size of each individual cob. These strip off the pieces of corn. Millions of corn niblets move along the conveyor belt like a river of gold. After a season in the fields, the corn needs to be washed. While they're taking a dip, any hollow pieces rise to the top, and these will be discarded. Now that it's clean, the corn gets sifted. Only bits of corn will make it through the holes. Anything that's bigger, like bits of leaf, will stay on top. Here, a special camera finds bad bits of corn as they shoot across its path. When it finds them, it blows them away with a jet of air. With only the very finest corn left, it's ready to be canned. A little salt and water is added to preserve the flavor of the corn. Then this machine loads each can with exactly 140 grams. A camera makes sure that each can has exactly the right amount. The lids need to be put on the cans in a vacuum so that no air gets sealed in. That happens in this chamber. There's one more step to ensure that the corn will last. The cans go into this machine that is like a giant boiling pot, and for six minutes they get heated from 25 to 130 degrees. This sterilizes the cans so it will keep the corn fresh for years. 20 minutes of gradual cooling and the best before date can be added. Finally, the cans are stacked and taken to the warehouse. 
Over two million cans are produced in just two months. They'll be labeled later and shipped all over Europe. The next time you open a tin of sweet corn, just remember that you are about to dig into the very finest niblets that have made it through a rigorous inspection and spare a thought for the lowly corns, which are only good enough for dog food. When you get stuck into a good thriller, you can tear through it in no time. And for this German factory, it's even quicker to print one. The novel arrives at the printers on a CD-ROM, which is loaded into a computer in the darkroom. Today, they're going to print the new book from the best-selling author of Jurassic Park, Michael Crichton. It's called Prey, or Beuter, as it will be known in Germany. The computer controls a laser, which engraves the layout of the book onto a printing plate. The text is created as the laser scratches through a thin layer of chrome to a layer of copper beneath. The rest of the process is just like producing a photo in a lab. The plate is dipped in developing fluid and 64 pages of text appear. They print the books two at a time, so it's actually 32 pages in duplicate, one copy above the other. Once the plate is developed, it heads off to a printing machine. The ink is transferred from the printer plate onto a rubber roll and then pressed onto the pages. They have to use a special type of paper which helps the ink to dry in less than two seconds. Otherwise, the pages whizzing through the maze of rollers would be an illegible smudge. The last section of the belt takes the sheets through a chute where they're folded in half. They come out as 32-page pamphlets, which will be bound together with the rest of the book later on. This book's going to be a hardback. And not surprisingly, the cover's made from a couple of pieces of thick cardboard. One for the front cover and one for the back. The spine is cut out from a large roll of cardboard. This green paper will be used to cover the cardboard and it will be stuck into place with glue. But it's not just going to be a blob in each corner. A special machine coats the green paper with a thin layer of glue and then stamps the cover firmly into place. Just like the pages, the covers are printed two at a time too. The title gets printed onto the spine by an ink ribbon, like you'd find in an old-fashioned typewriter, just a bit thicker. A metal stamp presses through the ribbon and the ink's transferred onto the cardboard. People always say that you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, and technically they're right. It's the dust jacket on top of the cover that's there to attract all the attention. The design on this jacket is going to be made up of four different colour pigments, which are applied one at a time. They check the copy against the original design to make sure they have got the right combination of colours.
all of the elements of the book are now finished, and it's time for the trickiest part of production, the assembly. The 32-page pamphlets are stacked in order above a conveyor belt. For this novel, there are 14. An ingenious system compiles the books in the correct order as the pamphlets drop onto the belt one by one. They stick in a sheet of black paper, which will go inside the cover. Then a machine crushes it all together to form a neat sandwich. The inside of the spine is slightly shredded. This will help the pages to stay in place. They coat the edge of the pages with a layer of glue, and then a thick piece of crepe paper is placed on. This helps to keep the pages in position for the rest of the process and also protects the spine. The books are still twins joined head to foot, but not for long. A blade cuts them in half. The large printed sheets have been folded into position so they still have seams on the outside. This is taken care of in no time by simply chopping off the edges of the pages. They squeeze the spine to give it a curve. Glue is sprayed on. And then the cover can be attached. They crimp the edge of the spine to allow the pages to fall open easily, and the hardback is finished. But before it can fly to the top of the bestseller list, it needs its dust jacket. A machine folds it around the covers, and then the books are ready to be packed and delivered to bookshops around the world. If the book is a hit, it will be sold out in no time, as they've only made 80,000 copies of this first edition. But with the slick press they've got in place, that's not a problem. They can print a second run in just a week.